Saul was just revealed to be alive, adding to the long, long list of One Piece characters we are led to believe are dead, only to turn out to be alive. And in Saul's case, I see a lot of readers defending this and even praising it as brilliant planning, since Aokiji used an attack called Ice Time Capsule, which means from the start, the possibility was always there that Saul may have been alive. And I get that. However, the issue I personally have with fake deaths in One Piece is not about the logic behind them. Really what I dislike is a particular type of fake death that I feel happens all too often in this otherwise masterfully written series. I think the ice time capsule discussion misses the greater point of criticism here, as just because a theory technically existed, just because this is not technically a plot hole or an asshole, in my opinion, none of that is really relevant when it comes to talking about the actual significance of killing off characters in writing and what that dramatic decision generally carries with it. Today's video has been a long time coming from me because I really have tried to ignore this aspect of the series for the longest time. I did not make this video after Pound, I didn't make it after Kinemon and Kiku, but at this point it's just something I can't not talk about. If you don't personally care and you like the fact that Saul is alive, then that is totally fine. I just wanted to share what my problem is personally with fake deaths in One Piece that people aren't really discussing. Before we get into it, make sure to subscribe and make sure to stop wasting your time cooking. Some people want to cook easy meals, other people like yourself don't want to cook at all, and people like you need to be using Factor, the sponsor for this video. If you are a lazy kid in college or a lazy adult like me, then don't make the mistake of getting fast food over and over again. Factor delivers fresh, delicious meals straight to your door you don't have to think about grocery shopping or cooking. And the food is prepared by chefs and dietitians so that it is guaranteed to be healthy and nutritious. It's made my life so much easier knowing that as soon as I finish a stream late at night, I have something nutritious and delicious ready to eat right away. And it's been helping me stick to my fitness goals without having to think about a healthy meal plan at all. So head to go.factor75.com slash morge60 and use code morge60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. That's go.factor75.com slash Morge60, code Morge60 to get 60% off. Link in the description below. So that aside, let me first quickly address two arguments and get them out of the way. I am not saying that characters need to die for a series to be good. I don't think you need characters to die to tell a good story. When people complain about characters not dying in One Piece, they are generally not saying that they want characters to die every arc, rather that they don't want the death fakeouts, where Oda is pretending that a character has died and then revealing for the umpteenth time that they're perfectly fine. I think most readers have a problem with death fakeouts, but here's the thing. I don't personally even have a huge problem problem with death fakeouts on their own for the most part. It's actually not uncommon for manga, movies, TV shows, etc. to leave you in suspense for a moment with a character's fate ambiguous, with it seeming like they have just died only to soon be revealed to have just barely survived. I think when done in moderation, this can be fun to throw in for the sake of suspense and tension. I agree Oda may definitely go overboard with this, so that we've kind of got a boy who cried wolf scenario at this point, where it's just hard to believe even genuine deaths, but in isolation it's honestly fine to do death fakeouts here and there, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I think there is a world of difference between death fakeouts and having false death scenes. Now I know those two sound like the same thing, but I didn't really know how to label these better and I think the distinction will make sense as I explain. As I said, while I don't think death fakeouts are necessarily that bad on their own, I personally really dislike Oda's specific habit of writing complete false death scenes and even false tragic stories. I think these fall into a completely different category and they are so egregious that I genuinely have difficulty thinking of any other movies, TV shows, and even manga that do it to the degree that One Piece does. Again, what I'm about to be talking about here has nothing to do with plot holes or inconsistencies or whether Oda planted an out for Saul with ice time capsule. What I'm going to be talking about here isn't about plot logic. It's about the emotion behind storytelling and what an author is promising the reader so as to elicit certain emotional reactions. So what do I mean when I'm talking about a death fakeout versus a false death scene? 
When Kiros cut off Doflamingo's head, I consider that a death fakeout. Or when Frankie thought his family had died from the Buster Call for a moment. Or when Pagaya got hit by God's judgment. Or when Kaido seemingly killed the CP0 agent Guernica. These are all moments where it briefly seemed like a character or characters had been killed off, but it turned out they were miraculously alive. Again, I do agree Oda does this probably a bit too often, but it's something that I personally kind of gloss over and have learned to accept, and sometimes there are good explanations of how said characters survived, such as Doflamingo's fruit allowing him to create puppets, or the Frankie family surviving thanks to Polly's rope work. And looking at the readers' reactions to Saul's survival, and how most readers seem to be perfectly accepting of it, and many even liking it, I think I realized that this is the part of Death Fakeouts that most readers seem to have the biggest problem with. Most readers, I believe, are primarily concerned with the explanation of how characters survived. Is the manner in which a character survives logical. Characters surviving seemingly fatal incidents without a decent reason seems to be the main thing readers seem to hold against Oda. But for me personally, that's only a minor aspect of it. That's why so many readers are okay with Saul surviving because technically there is a logical reason for it when that isn't really relevant to what I personally dislike about Saul's survival. What tends to disappoint me personally is not when the author just does a throwaway death fake out on its own, but as I said, writing a false death scene, which is when the author writes in a full, elaborate, dramatic, emotional death scene, a tragic final send off for a character filled with tears and heart-wrenching last words and poetic messaging and maybe even a few flashbacks. And then all of that turns out to be the author just faking it. People often compare Pagaya's survival to Pell's, and to me, those fall into two very different categories of generic death fakeout versus false death scene. Because yes, both these characters survive extreme damage without any explanation, but Pagaya's case I just view as a regular death fakeout. There wasn't much to it. There's a sudden attack. We're made to think he dies. It happens fairly quickly and abruptly as a shocking moment to add tension. And then some dozens of chapters later, we realize he's alive, which sure, it doesn't make sense. But I'm just like, hey, it's One Piece, whatever. The arc's over, I'll roll with it. But with Pell, the difference is Oda really cashed in dramatically on the idea that he was killing off this character. Oda wrote Pell's sacrifice as a genuine death scene. It is an entire chapter dedicated to selling the reader on the notion that the story is making the most dramatic move possible and having a character actually die for the sake of Alabasta and every bit of dramatic juice is squeezed out of this moment. We are taken through the flashbacks, the final words, the tearful goodbyes. Oda is doing everything he can to impart a sense of finality to the moment. This whole scene is a tribute to Pell to add a real sense of dramatic weight to the arc. And the whole thing is just BS. It's a lie. It's a cheap trick. It's abusing the use of death in storytelling to squeeze out a certain emotional reaction from the reader, the type of feeling that can only be earned through the death of a character, but then the author is not actually following through on what that entails. It is essentially having your cake and eating it too. I really, really dislike this practice because it hurts the overall power of the story for a short-term fleeting gain. I initially felt emotional reading Pell's death the first time around. So it's something that works the first time, but that's it, only once, because now I know the truth. Now when I reread Alabasta, instead of this chapter standing out as a fittingly powerful moment at the climax of the arc to punctuate the difficulty of the hero's struggle and to segue perfectly into Luffy's cathartic victory over Crocodile, this chapter now reads like a joke something to be skimmed through, glossed over, and ignored, as it actually hurts the actual sense of drama and tension that has been established in the final battle. That, to me, is the difference between Pagaya's situation and Pell's situation. The difference between what I view as a generic death fakeout versus a false death scene. To me, the difference is whether or not the author is actually trying to cash in on the emotion of killing a character. With Pagaya, Oda really didn't do that much beyond the bare minimum reaction of Connus. Whereas with Pell, Oda really dug in and tried to squeeze out all the completely unearned dramatic juice. That's the difference between a death fake out and a false death scene. And that recurring instance of false death scenes in One Piece 
is my main problem today with the Saul situation, as to me, this is the point where I can't not talk about it anymore. So before we get into Saul, taking a step back, looking at death in writing in general, and why it's such an important decision, such that even Oda has talked about the importance of the permanence of death. Why is that? It's because authors are always striving to get a powerful emotional response out of the reader. How do you get the strongest emotional response out of the reader? By writing in something with the ultimate dramatic consequence, a character death or sacrifice, due to the immutability of that tragedy, and then crafting a full scene around said moment so that the reader can really soak in the full emotional impact of this moment of grand consequence that is happening. The power of a dramatic death scene is earned through its finality, its permanence, the reality of the consequence. To me, it is simply indescribably cheap to write full scenes like this, like with Pell, like with Pound, and now with Saul, to squeeze all that emotional feeling out of the reader, emotion that is predicated on the author pretending to the reader that in this moment the author is doing something deeply tragic and final with a character that we care about. And then waiting dozens or maybe even hundreds or maybe even 700 chapters before revealing it was just a lie, so that by this point it's been so long that the reader has forgotten about what they were feeling back then and are more open to accepting that this distant moment of the past was in fact a lie. So you see, my issue with Saul coming back is not the logic of it. If Oda had done a typical death fakeout, where Saul just yells something at Robin to run away or something, and then Aokiji did Ice Time Capsule, and then 700 chapters later we found out that, oh, Saul's still alive, I wouldn't really care. I'd be perfectly okay with it. What I dislike is how the scene was written. Because in this moment, in this chapter, we are being sold on the belief that this is the end of Saul. Yes, Ice Time Capsule was always included in the scene, so the out was technically always there, but the reality is that when you first watch or read this scene, that is not what is going on in the back of your head. You are not thinking, oh, Saul is obviously alive after this, because in the moment, this whole scene is very much being presented to us with all the emotion and drama and scene direction that you would expect an author to only use if the character is actually dying, because it would of course be ridiculous to milk this so hard if this was just a fake out. I don't wanna hear revisionist history, that it was always obvious that Saul survived this, as the reality is that pretty much the entirety of the One Piece reader base has always named Saul, along the likes of Hiroluk, Bellamere, and Corazon, as the saddest backstory deaths, that the consensus was, were all actually dead. As a comparison, when fans theorized that Sabo was still alive, the difference was that in First of All, Sabo being alive was almost painfully obvious, as Oda did not bother showing us a body, and literally the next chapter, Dragon's ship was treating the injuries of some mysterious survivor. Looking at past community discussions, it's arguable that literally most readers believe that Sabo was alive whereas the Ice Time Capsule theory has always been a footnote theory in the community that would occasionally be mentioned here or there as an interesting possibility, but the reality is almost the entirety of the reader base accepted Saul as dead. And if you really want to debate that point and say it was obvious to you that Saul was alive and you never bought this scene for a second, then fine, it doesn't really matter, since again, the more important point I'm getting at is that the bigger difference is that Oda never tried to milk Sabo's death scene. Sabo's death by cannon fire is actually written without much drama or fanfare. It happens pretty quickly without much of a send off for the character. Oda really didn't try to milk emotion out of the reader to make us cry reading Sabo's death. This incident was solely important to have an impact on Luffy and Ace and to make them cry. Saul's death is of course important for Robin, but it is also 100% written to be an extremely memorable and emotionally moving scene for the reader itself, which is completely unearned if the author is not actually following through on the tragedy that he is telling us is happening. So for me, what is personally lost here with Saul's revival is two important things. First is of course the power of Saul's death, and second is the flow of Robin's backstory in general. Before this, Robin's backstory was, for me, the saddest backstory in One Piece. And honestly, it was probably the most emotionally affecting piece for me to go back to and read in general out of any series. You might be saying, why should Saul's revival matter? 
because there are other sad things that happen in Robin's backstory, so it's okay to remove one. And to that I say yet again, that's not the point. I'm not arguing X's and O's as though this is math. I'm talking about storytelling. Robin's entire backstory is constructed around the dynamic of her and Saul. That is the crucial relationship and bond that is the backbone of the entire series of events of Robin's backstory, such that her backstory works in a sort of crescendo of tragedies, with Robin first losing Clover, then her mother, then all the other people of her island, and finally the climax is her losing Saul. Even if that is not the saddest moment of her backstory for you personally, that is undeniably the climax of her backstory in general. And so when I reread this backstory, the story of Robin, it is now still an undeniably sad story for the first 80% that is ultimately soured by culminating in a Pell moment. The backstory as a whole no longer emotionally reads the same for me, personally, as it climaxes with such a hollow, cheap scene, even if objectively other sad things do happen in the buildup along the way. There is simply no reason for me to ever go back and reread Robin's backstory, as why should I be moved by this concluding scene any more than I should be moved by Pell's scene or Pound's scene. Now, you might say that, well, the idea of what's happening here is still sad, the intent is still there, Saul is still intending to sacrifice himself for Robin, and Robin does think that Saul is dying, and Saul is willing to go out with a smile, and Saul is still leaving her with this message about friendship, but there is a world of difference between an idea of something sad taking place versus the finality of it actually occurring. A tragedy is a tragedy when it actually happens. To me, that's the beauty of this scene. Saul telling Robin that she's never going to be alone. Why? Because even though Saul himself is going to be gone after this forever, even though she is losing the one person that she has forever, even though all that's left is the hope and the message that she will find some others like him because he is gone forever, that final message that she clings onto ultimately leads her to finding something even greater. That is the beauty of storytelling, when you actually lose something before gaining something better. Saul's sacrifice is far more poetic when the sacrifice actually took place, and not just the idea of the sacrifice took place. It's like, yeah, Zoro being willing to sacrifice himself for Luffy is definitely cool as a concept, but it is not a tragedy unless he actually died in this scene. I personally thought that the tragedy of Saul, the story his character went through, was a beautiful story as it was. The story of a man that went against the world for the sake of his own justice, that befriended this little girl who no one else would, and fought the world for her for the sake of his own justice, who did all this seemingly in vain as ultimately he could not fight the world on his own. But in his death and sacrifice, he was able to impart certain ideals on this little girl that would make a difference one day, that would lead to a brighter future for the world, even if he himself could not live to see it. That was the tragedy of Saul. This story that I just recounted no longer exists. It's been deleted from One Piece. Instead of the poetic beauty of a good man dying in an unjust world, we have Saul, the giant who got burned really bad but got out okay. And hey, he's probably going to get to meet that little girl again, and they will probably get a nice reunion anyway. Which look, it's nice, but to me it is far, far less powerful than the story we originally had. And finally, if what I'm saying really doesn't make sense, let me give you some examples that may make you see things a little differently. Fisher Tiger story. Another beautiful, tragic story. The story of a man who fought for his people and even hoped for a day where his fishman race and the humans could live in harmony. But he was ultimately betrayed for his idealism and in turn revealed the deep-seated hate in his own heart that no matter his better judgment, he could not get rid of. To the point that he refused the blood of the race that he despised, even if it would save his own life. Fisher Tiger's story is the tragedy of a man who knew what the right thing was, but who had suffered so much that he could not bring himself to overcome the hate and prejudice that he had rightfully developed over time, leading to his own death. That is a tragic story. Now let's say we throw in an ice time capsule in there. Let's say Oda had included a little panel of a clipboard towards the end of Fisher Tiger's backstory that shows that, hey, look, if you look closely, there actually was a fishman on board that had the right type of blood to give Fisher Tiger a transfusion. And so even though we thought Fisher Tiger had died, Maybe 500 chapters later, Oda reveals that it's actually okay, since secretly, a fishman was able to give him a transfusion back then. It's all okay then, right? 
There's no plot hole since Oda had planted and out. This clipboard, he planned Fisher Tiger's survival all along. It's just like Ice Time Capsule, right? But do you see why that's not the point in the slightest? To me, it's not about whether or not Oda planted and out. It's the fact that now the tragedy of Fisher Tiger no longer exists. It is utterly neutered. The tragedy of the story was that the hate between fishmen and humans went so deep that even a well-intentioned, reasonable man like Fisher Tiger ultimately died rather than mix his blood with theirs. The story has power because of the tragedy that it actually culminated in. You can apply this to any tragic story. Imagine if at Nolan's execution, we see a little figure in the background that looks like Kalgara. And then it's revealed 500 chapters later that, hey, you know what? Noland and Kalgara actually did get to secretly reunite before Noland's death at some point, since Kalgara was able to secretly find a way down to the Blue Sea that no one had heard about. It's not a plot hole, since Oda planted the truth all along, therefore it's all planned, therefore it's okay. Again, to me, that's not relevant. It's not a plot hole, but the tragedy of Noland and Kalgara was in the fact that they were never able to meet again. If they secretly got to meet again, then the beauty of the tragedy of Noland and Kalgara is gone. Ace's death, same thing. Imagine if somewhere in Marine Ford there was a throwaway panel of some whitebeard pirate named Mr. Fixit, who had a hole fixing fruit. So let's say in the background we got a quick panel slipped in somewhere of him fixing a hole with his devil fruit at the start of the war. And then, 700 chapters after Ace's death, turns out Ace was secretly saved by the Whitebeard Pirates since in his final moments they managed to get him to Mr. Fixit off screen. And of course, it's perfectly logical plot-wise since Oda wrote an out. There was a character that could save Ace at Marine Ford all along. So sure, it's not an ass pull, but do you get why I still wouldn't enjoy it? Because my question to you is this. Would you ever view Ace's death scene as a tragedy again? Would you ever be able to take these final moments seriously? Would the emotions ever hit you the same way again? Because they don't hit for me for Pell anymore, they don't for Pound, and now they don't for Saul. And as much as I love lore reveals in One Piece, at the end of the day, I care about the emotion that Oda is able to bring out by writing such tragic stories more. I think that that is genuinely his greatest strength above anything else. So it genuinely disappoints me when some of my favorite parts of One Piece are rendered hollow in retrospect for the sake of, I guess, connecting some more lore that could probably have been done in some other manner if needed. So I know this was a controversial video, but I just wanted to share how I felt and why I felt this way because this series is important to me. And if you agree or disagree, then definitely let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please like, comment, and subscribe. And you can get my extended thoughts on this and all future topics by becoming a member. Just hit the button below.